trying to figure out ways to fix every single thing on the bike while I'm out there. Nah. Yeah. I mean, so they are such finely tuned machines. It mm-hmm. would be like traveling with a piano and expecting to just like tune it. Yeah. It's like. Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Crystal Sursley to talk about what everyone should know about maintaining their bike. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED52. So, using a bike as your primary form of transportation has a lot of advantages Um, and one of the things that I really love about it is that unlike owning a car cars are so complex they're huge pieces of machinery lots of moving parts it's really unreasonable for most people who are driving a car to understand how they work aside from like I don't know changing the oil every once in a while Um, but bikes much smaller much simpler Uh, easier to understand how they work. So uh, even if you don't have like all the tools or the skills to repair every single part, um, it's not too difficult to really wrap your head around, you know, how this thing functions. And by extension, it's a lot easier, I think, to understand uh, how to maintain it properly in the long term. So yeah, that's why we've got Crystal here today, who works at Lower Town Bike Shop here in St. Paul. Hello. And we're going to talk about... uh, the basics of what you need to know. Okay, so Crystal, I, I kind of separated out the different things that I'm aware of. Yes. Uh, in terms of bike maintenance into like the things that that you should be doing on a regular basis, you know, the things that should be like top of your mind. And then, you know, then there are things that happen less frequently that like, okay. And, and ideally, I think those things kind of also correlate to the things you should take it into the shop for hopefully happen less frequently. Yes. But it's not it's not like a one to one no ratio. So let's get into it. What kinds of things do you think everybody should be able to like do on their own with their bike? Um the two most important things, um, and the two things that are gonna keep your bike protected and um, keep you rolling easily are pumping your tires and lubricating your chain. Okay. Um, Like 90% of the the reason people stop riding their bikes is because they have a flat tire and that in itself is too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you can pump your tires and recognize when it's flat and that you can bring it into a shop, you can kind of get over this hump. Like it's not that scary and these things aren't that um, overwhelming or intimidating to do. Yeah. Yeah. And and luckily, like changing a tire yourself is also something that doesn't take, you know, very many tools. For the most part, you just need like the replace, you know, a, an inner tube to replace the first one with. Uh, maybe some uh, tire hooks to get in there. And Tire you know. levers are a huge help. Yeah. Butter knives are not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> no. Or screwdrivers because that's a, a great way to ensure a pinch. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I did watch one time um, one of the guys who work at bicycle chain just like take the tires off of my wheel with his bare hands and i was like what (laughs) it's it's something that can be done and like um larger tires it's a lot easier uh but not fat tires those are in Mm. like insanely difficult um but it's something we challenge each other to at the shop like can you get this tire (laughs) on and off with your hands your grip strength really improves the more flat changes you do for sure okay yeah (laughs) It must be like if you go bouldering a lot, you probably have like you yeah. Know th- <laughs> this is maybe that'll help like hiring uh in the su- the spring like who can help me change the flats the best like <laughs> I'll test their grip strength ask, ask if they do bouldering. There we go. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Um. So yeah, like me personally, I mean, when you're riding around in town, you're not too far away from like any given bike shop, and also there's you know buses that you can just throw your bike onto. Um. You know, you, you don't really need to worry about having to being able to, like, replace a t- an inner tube and pump it up yourself. Um, I personally find that it's, you know, useful to be able to do that on the road, you know, because sometimes it's just it's it is more convenient to like. And you're probably going to experience it if you're biking a lot in the city. I mean, even mm-hmm. with really good puncture 
protected tires. We have insane infrastructure right now, a lot of potholes and yeah. a lot of debris, especially in St. Paul. Um, there are some really good like YouTube tutorials. So if you are stuck on the side of the road and you have the tools available, there's a good way to kind of guide you through it if you feel that you are mechanically inclined to do so. Um, I... I believe it's a skill that is incredibly helpful. I think some people are a little intimidated by it, but mm -hmm. um, I don't think you have to be. Um, the more you practice, the easier it becomes. Yeah. 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 And it's one of those things like that is a great basic skill to learn um, that is pretty accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, but the tire levers are a huge help. Um, I highly recommend CO2 cartridges over frame pumps. Okay, quick explanation here about what frame pumps and CO2 cartridges are. Uh, a frame pump is a really small hand-operated pump that uh, is compact enough to attach to your frame, and they usually come with like, you know, a, a little clip-on thing that you uh, screw onto your frame uh, next to like your water bottle holder, and then the pump just attaches to that. Uh, a CO2 cartridge is a really small little metal cartridge of compressed pressurized carbon dioxide uh, that you can use to just like press the nozzle of it onto the uh, stem of your inner tube and it will very quickly inflate the inner tube with uh, the compressed CO2. My mantra is 20 PSI and you want to die. Like that's, <laughs> it takes so much work to yeah. pump your tires to 20 PSI with a frame pump that like uh, a CO2 cartridge is so much easier. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I learned the hard way last winter that like, okay, people told me, okay, you want to lower the pressure in your tires when it's, you know, really slippery out because then, you know, you get better traction. And I was like, cool. And, but I didn't really know what number I should be shooting for. So I ended up having my my tires much lower, I think, than I should have w because I kept getting pinch flats. Yeah, that definitely will cause them. Um, did you follow the guidelines on the sidewall of your tire? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> so um, on the sidewall of your tire, there's always, well, not always, but mostly uh, always a stated PSI, mm -hmm. a minimum and a maximum. Um, I try to like, with winter riding, and people can really geek out about their tire pressure, I usually feel safe going about 15 PSI under the maximum amount, sometimes 20. Oh, wow. Um, I don't mm -hmm. like to ride really, really low because of the ability ability to get pinch flats. Yeah. And I usually find that that is low enough for me to like handle just about anything. But again, it's personal preference. Mm -hmm. But checking that minimum, and I don't know, I, I geek out. I'm usually like, mm, at least maybe 10 PSI above the minimum, you know, just to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also part of my issue is that I didn't have a good way to check that when I was like pumping up my tires away from home because my frame pump doesn't have a gauge on it. Yeah. So. And were yeah. you using a frame pump? Uh, occasionally. Yeah. Like if I, if I needed to change a tire while I was at school or something like that, you know, and I just didn't have a floor pump. So in the classroom, <laughs> one of the things I do to kind of help guide me, which it's not super accurate, but it does help. If you can squeeze your tire and mm -hmm. it can go in, then you're usually about half your max recommended PSI, like okay. or less than half. Mm -hmm. So I like to make sure that I can't even squeeze it or it can squeeze it just a little bit because I know then that it's like it's way too low. Mm. Yep. OK, good. Let's see, other other things that might happen to you while you're out on the road. Um, I've I've had my chains just come off of like the, the front chain ring or, you know, that's usually yeah, usually the front chain ring. Um, and that one's not too hard to to fix. You just need to, you know, grab it with your hands and, and if if you've got a derailleur, then uh, kind of push that forward a little bit. So yeah, that, that you... long arm of the derailleur. Mm -hmm. If you know what the derailleur is, the rear derailleur, there's a little arm that you can kind of push forward and give you slack to get on to yeah. the to the uh, chain rings in front. But if you are dropping your chain fairly regularly, it's probably because you need um, a, a front derailleur adjustment mm -hmm. or a rear, depending on where it's falling off, or a rear derailleur adjustment. But that is usually a good indication that like you've experienced some cable stretch and your derailleur probably needs a little bit of adjustment. Yeah. Yep. Um, that one, like, it's also really satisfying to put your chain on <laughs> when yeah. it falls off. I don't know what it is, but it's just, it's actually pretty easy when you realize how easy it is. It's like, oh, yeah, this, and that is something that I, 
I am always happy to demonstrate when people come in. Like, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to stop you from riding. It actually only takes, you know, a couple seconds to pop it back on. And then you have, like, the kind of, you know, not battle scars, but, you know, you've got some grease on your fingers for a little while afterwards. And yep. it's like, yeah, I got I got my hands dirty on this one. Just don't wipe your face. Yeah. <laughs> and end up with little mustaches sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, we were uh, we were just talking uh, before we started the show about uh, me having to readjust my fenders all the freaking time, uh, and yeah, that like fenders are really really finicky, um, but the tools that are necessary for that aren't complicated. I just have a small wrench that's the right size for the nuts that that hold yep. those in place. So a nice multi tool with a few different um, Allen sizes are kind of key. Mm-hmm. Um, Usually the four, six, and eight are the most common. Um, anything in that range usually is helpful. Um, sometimes there's a five in there. Um, yeah, but it's not too terribly complicated. Um, one thing we have experienced with fixed fenders in the winter is that you can experience something called snowpack, where the snow gets caught between the fenders and your studded tire, or even your knobby tire. Um, a lot of us at the shop tend to ride with clip fenders to kind of avoid it and also avoid the nuisance of having to readjust. Mm-hmm. But the drawback of that is if you have racks, then it can be complicated trying to get them installed. Okay. Yep. And so then like if, yeah, that's just like you have too much snow that's getting caught in there and then more and more snow gets pushed in yep, there. Yeah, it just kind of does a build up. And then you just have lots of rubbing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and I'll have people who come in and like they're like, "Oh, my fenders were rubbing terribly, but they're fine now." And I'm like, "Generally, snowpack." Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. If you find that your chain is jumping between gears when you aren't shifting, it is sometimes possible to fix that without any tools out on the road. Many rear derailers have what is called a barrel adjuster. Right where the shifting cable meets the derailleur, there is a circular part that you can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise, and then this tightens or loosens the cable in very small increments, which then affects how far left or right the derailleur sits uh, at each gear. I I take pride in being able to like fine tune my barrel adjuster on my rear Mm -hmm. derailleur to like get it like just right, you know, Um, which is. I think something that I wouldn't expect most people to have to care about. Some people really like being able to adjust uh, their shifting using their barrel adjusters. Other people find it incredibly overwhelming and Mm -hmm. very confusing. Mm -hmm. Like, which way do I turn it to to tighten it or to loosen it? Um, The one word to the wise is do not mess with your uh, screws on your derailleur. Okay, yep. We have had like situations where a lot of people try to fix their derailleurs on their own and it costs like three times the amount because it takes three times the time to try to figure out how they messed it up and Mm -hmm. how we're gonna fix it so you know barrel adjusters totally fine if you play with them you can usually figure out which way is tightening and which way is loosening Mm -hmm. um but i highly recommend not to mess with the actual derailleur limit screws right yeah (laughs) yeah and when i've when i've adjusted the barrel adjuster i i didn't really worry about like which direction it's shifting it because i wasn't doing it by sight you know yep. i was just kind of like riding and it's like oh it feels a little bit chunky like i can kind of feel that it's in between two of them and so i like turn it a quarter turn in one direction and then you know keep riding oh that didn't do it okay let's do two quarter turns in the opposite direction see how that feels and that's a good way to do it and quarter turns are the key um you don't ever want to just start spinning it you okay. want to just incrementally adjust it and that i mean by feel is the best way and i think that that's probably why people get confused by it that's that was the most confusing thing to me to Mm -hmm. figure it out was when i was being taught how to adjust my barrel adjusters i was taught directionally like Uh. oh you got to go clockwise or counterclockwise and my brain could not compute like how that transition to my derailleur like Mm -hmm. well what do you mean like is it gonna go this way or that way like so feel is probably the best way to yeah. To understand what's right. And you know, I don't think that anybody actually told me that like you should do it by quarter turn specifically. I think it's just because the the barrel adjuster has like four little arms on it that it's just it feels right to like turn it a quarter turn. Well, I'm glad it's an intuitive design. That's yeah. that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Very much smarter people than I designed those. <laughs> me as well. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
And yeah, you, so you mentioned like Allen wrenches. Um, I, I found that most things that attach to a bike take Allen wrenches mm-hmm. of some kind, you know, so like your water bottle cage, um, if you have some sort of like holster for a, a lock or um, the cargo racks, right? Um, those all take Allen wrenches of some some yep, size mostly um the thing about bicycles is that nothing is standardized okay except water bottle cages seem to be like the one thing where mm-hmm. like there is some standard there um some people have bolt-on wheels um and mm. then you'll need a wrench um old bikes can be uh a standard and not metric um <laughs> which makes it really fun. Uh-huh. And then if you have racks or something where you've had to have a piece that adjusts how they attach to your bike, usually with older bikes, mm. you might find that you might need a couple of other tools. But for the most part, across the board, um, Allen wrenches are are going to do most of what you'll ever need to do. Adjust your seat, um, install your water bottle cages, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, like... Most, I think most uh, bike shops sell like little, like a multi tool that just looks like a, a, a pocket knife, but it just has like a bunch of different sizes of Allen yeah. wrenches on yep. it. Yep, there's so many different varieties. It's pretty amazing. Um, recently, my favorite thing that just came out um, is a little ratcheting Allen wrench. Um, okay. And so it's like a tiny little ratchet wrench where the, uh, the little different Allen heads slide in and out. Um, it's probably oh. three inches long. Okay. Um, it's incredible. Like, I just got it. Um, it folds up. It fits in your... And it does all the same thing as a multi-tool. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also comes with tire levers and an extension. Nice. And like, I, I wrap it around my arm because I can flip it inside out. And I, that's what I use when I'm working on the sales floor. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, this is incredible. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> what convenience. I know. They're the... Uh, endless um technology that continues to come out it's pretty great um so i i had uh posted online to get like questions and suggestions for for topics and things from people um and one of the subreddits that i posted in was in the like bike touring and bike packing subreddits and so of course the folks in there had a lot of other suggestions for things that you should carry with you on your bike yeah and you'll find with the bike community everybody has very uh firm opinions on things Mm -hmm. um that does tend to be something that i've noticed across the board and if you're touring um you do you, I mean, you could potentially need um, more tools. We do a lot of touring, and we use like the first three years we packed basically like a whole mechanics tool yeah. kit, <laughs> and now we bring like next to nothing because we needed so few of mm-hmm. the tools. Like we've had a couple, we've had a tacoed wheel, um, and luckily we were touring with mechanics, so it's you know they were able to get us back on the road. Um, we've needed a pedal wrench, we've needed pumps, um, and we've needed our multi-tools, but, um, yeah. 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 P- people were talking about like, well, you know, I always bring like extra cables and, you know, like, and I'm like, my goodness, why would I want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it, like for, depending, I guess, on the length of the tour, but you can definitely get excessive. Mm-hmm. I mean, we did it. We probably, it was like 50 extra pounds the first couple of years and they were totally unnecessary. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it just makes me laugh. Like there is such thing as overprepared. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. This, this week when um I had one of the cranks fall off of my bike and I took it to you guys and, um and I thought about it, I was like, what if that happened while I was like going around Lake Superior? And I'm like, I should be able to. No, 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 Ian. That's that's a dangerous road to go down. Like just <laughs> trying to figure out ways to fix every single thing on the bike while I'm out there. Nah. Yeah, I mean, so they are such finely tuned machines. Mm-hmm. It would be like traveling with a piano and expecting to just like tune it. Yeah. On site, you know, I mean, it's there's just so many things, and they seem very simplistic, and in a lot of ways they are, but the, in a lot of ways they're very complicated because they mm-hmm. are so finely tuned, and there are so many small parts, and like, you know, are you going to be able to repair your derailleur? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on what went wrong with it. So, yeah, I mean, there's... I I, I get questions from, from people who primarily drive cars. They're like, you're going, like, all the way to Eau Claire? What if, you know, what if you break down in the middle of it? And I'm like, well... What do you do if your car breaks down in the middle of a drive? Like, exactly. I, I, I call for help. <laughs> yep. Just like everybody else. And it's part of the adventure. Yeah. It's, yeah. (laughs) 
Okay, so let's let's talk about stuff that uh, people can do at home on their mm-hmm. own to, to maintain their bike. Um, and I guess the first question here would be like, what should people be doing on a regular basis? It's a great question. At home to, to keep it in good working order. So a big one is lubricating your chain. Um, you need to lubricate it probably more often than you think, um, <laughs> especially winter riding, which I'll talk about that separately. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally with summer riding, every week to two weeks is a good um, rule of thumb. Um, or... Once every two weeks or if you, like, drive through wet conditions Mm because that can clean off some of the lubricant and cause it to uh, dry out faster. And So so is this more of a time-based thing or should I be paying attention to, like, my mileage as well? um, Both and also listening to your bike. Okay. Um, So your your chain will tell you when it's super dry. I call it squirrels. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a bunch of little squirrels or mice in your, um, like rear wheel area it kind of just comes from all of the derail your your cassette and your chain all at once in fact i'll hear people riding down the street and i'm like twitching like please lubricate your chain that is so loud um you can also visually see when a chain is dry Mm -hmm. um and that's a really good time to lubricate I'm meticulous about my chain cleaning. I've actually had one chain last me for 9,000 miles, and it's not even super wow. high end. It, I just keep it looking like new all the time. So we're talking not looking for rust necessarily. If it gets to the rust point, that's yeah. you've let it go too far. Um, I've actually never had a chain rust out on me until this summer. Uh, we did a, a tour, and we had a flash rust rust situation that i've never experienced before we just got caught in such torrential downpours repeatedly Mm -hmm. in one day that by the next morning everything had like my chain had rusted i've (laughs) never i couldn't believe it i was like oh my god um but i generally generally would never let my chain rust at all i I just do not let it get to that point Mm -hmm. Um, so so what should we be looking for visually um so if it looks dry it kind of like gives it a like a light chalky appeal or appearance almost um it's so when it's lubricated you can see a sheen to it Mm -hmm. and when it's dry that sheen is gone okay um so i like to always keep it with that sheen and then you want to remember when you lubricate it um apply it liberally basically to each link And then wipe it off really good because you're lubricating the little pins inside, not the whole chain itself. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you just put the lubrication on and leave it, it actually collects more dirt and makes your chain stretch faster and dry out faster. Okay. Also, should I wipe it down before I lubricate it or just after? um, I usually do it after. I really like a chain lube called ProLink ProGold because it cleans and it lubricates. And so I coat it really good and then um, I wipe it down I keep wiping it down sometimes I'll repeat the process if it's been if it's coming out pretty dirty Mm -hmm. or if it is really dirty I might repeat the process two or three times before I can get it to that like almost like new look Um, one thing I want to say is WD-40 is not a chain lubricant (laughs) it is a degreaser and it will have the opposite effect and there is something like my dad was I was like just put a little WD-40 on it and I'm like that's so if you've ever been told that please don't do that get some chain lube <laughs> um okay so cleaning and lubricating the chain mm-hmm. anything else um pumping your tires at least once a week okay. at the minimum if you have a really uh, narrow row tire you can lose 20 to 40 psi in like 24 to 48 hours so every couple like every other day i pump mm-hmm. to full inflation um and with a road bike with uh, skinnier tires, um, having f- the higher PSI will help protect against pinch flats mm-hmm. most of the time. Okay. Not all of the time, but most of the time. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, and that, I think that's true kind of across the board. Um, I I tend to, and of course, there will be people who disagree because it spikes. Um, but I, like in summer riding, I really like to just be at full pressure unless mm-hmm. mountain biking, which is a totally different that's a yeah yep. different ball game. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so yeah, you mentioned winter maintenance, and this was the subject that I got the most questions from, especially good, in the cy- cycling MSP subreddit. Awesome. Um, probably helps that we're doing this episode in February. So. Yes. Yeah. What what kinds of changes do we make to our maintenance schedule in the in the winter? So, um, the thing about riding in Minnesota winters is that we have this salt and sand solution that just 
eat through our drivetrains. Um, so keeping your drivetrain clean is so important. Um, you're probably going to have to replace your chain. Um, and if that's the only thing you have to replace in the winter, you're doing pretty good. Um, derailleurs, any external gears, um, all the little pieces that uh, make up a derailleur mm-hmm. tend to get corroded, stop working, stop moving. A lot of people shifting stops working about halfway through the winter, sometimes even like a couple weeks in, depending on the conditions they were riding in. Mm-hmm. So if you are riding with external gears, I highly recommend cleaning your bike like once a week um, and then really lubricating the chain. Uh, Don just soap and water are a great way to like base clean. Um, getting like surface stuff off their frame. I always find that rubbing alcohol, if you're just spot cleaning works really well. Okay. Um, if you can get it in some form of a shower, that's always the best. Okay. Always, always the best. Um, I saw your bike when we came in and I saw it yesterday before you cleaned it. <laughs> and if you're just spot cleaning, you're doing a really good job because it looks lovely. Yeah. I, I used, um, some, some dish soap on a rag and just, you know. Yep. And of course, like I had to rinse out the rag probably 15 times over the course of the entire <laughs> yeah. bike. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we recommend people just do single speeds or internally geared hubs for the winter because it actually will save on the cost of repair. Okay. Um, we've seen where whole drivetrains have to re- be replaced every spring or every other spring, which could be a couple hundred dollars to several hundred to, you know, 500, depending on how fancy your drivetrain is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, since speed isn't usually your friend in the winter, doing a single speed uh, or internally geared hub if you're in a hilly area is, mm-hmm. is a great way because then your cost of repair is so much less and then you don't have to worry about things not working in the end because, you know, you got one gear to worry about. So, But I'm so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so – the amount of effort you're putting in keeping your bike clean. <laughs> That's true. That's very like, true. And, and it is the, the switch off. And, like, you c- – I – believe with bicycles you can do whatever you want to do like you know whatever works for you i I just have to pay the price (laughs) exactly exactly (laughs) and if like having gears and cleaning it regularly and if they keep working and you're okay with that like all right Um, but a lot of people don't clean their bikes Mm -hmm. and like in fact most people (laughs) don't clean their bikes and what i see come springtime is is a lot of cost and repair so for ease or, or uh, saving in the long run, because the cost of a winter bike mm-hmm. is just like a couple seasons of repair, usually. At our shop, we mm. do used bikes, so you can get a winter bike for like 350 bucks. Okay. It's, you know, there's there's definitely ways to do it. Um, yeah. So that was actually another question that I got uh, was, when does it make sense to not put effort into maintaining a bike? So like if I get a winter beater how much maintenance should I be doing on that? Or should I just not care? Um, I uh, would say you should definitely care. I, I, should, I knew I you were like, going to say that. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, that's kind of a, a hard question because I'm like, of course you should care. Um, I don't think that a winter bike has to be a beater. Like my mm-hmm. winter bike is beautiful. It's it's something that I take a lot of pride in. And I'm also super attached to just like all my other bikes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I – Maintain it. And if you, again, do single speed, the cost of maintaining is so much less that, um, you know, if that's what's prohibiting you from wanting to, like, maintain a winter beater. Now, if you're getting to the point where you have let your bike go and it's corroded and it's rusted and every single part of it is gone, you might come into a shop and I might say, like, we can fix it or it might be more cost effective to just get a different bike. Um and really, that's kind of up to the rider. But uh, lubricating very, very regularly, keeping it clean, keeping your tires pump, like these are always things that like throughout the winter are, are worthwhile doing. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You mentioned belt drives as well. That's because mm-hmm. um, th- those are bikes that don't have a chain, but they have a, it's not rubber. It's made of, what is it? What are those it's belts? It's often made of? made of carbon. Okay. Um, so belt drives are awesome because they last uh about uh i think a hundred times longer than a chain wow they i think it's a hundred thousand miles before they stretch or something like that it's pretty wild you can uh damage them in other ways um if things are not quite properly set up but Mm -hmm. um we love them for winter because then you don't have to worry about the rust Mm -hmm. and the people who i know who have gotten belt drives for the winter have been super happy about like the lack of maintenance uh needed to keep going um and that way you don't have to worry 
like nearly as much. And almost all uh, belt drives are internally geared hubs. Yeah. So you can get a good gear range. Um, yeah. And I mean, based on my very limited research, like internal gear hubs are rather expensive. Yes. Yep. Okay. Generally, they're quite a bit more. Um, belt drives are also a bit more of a investment. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, you save all that money on the back end. Um, we have seen like quality is really important when it comes to, uh, belt drives. Like if you're not a hard rider, if you're, you know, a pretty, uh, fair weather or you maybe you don't push hard or you're not um riding far mm -hmm. the lower quality belt drives are fine but if you're a hard rider um the ones that are lower quality have a hard time kind of holding up to to being ridden pretty hard and okay I think that's the only thing to consider while looking at a belt drive Ah, here was an interesting question. Is there, what are the major differences in bike maintenance if you, like during the winter months, if you keep it on a trainer inside? Okay, um, that's a good one. So I see a lot of like uh, cracked tires on hmm. the sidewall because people aren't pumping their tires. And often with trainer bikes, we see a lot more typical road bikes, uh, skinnier tires. Mm -hmm. So making sure you're pumping your tires regularly. Um I'd say if they're 700 by like 23 to 28, like every couple of days. Um, the other thing is sweat can be pretty corrosive. Huh. Um, so it's it's actually quite fascinating. You can rust out your chain with your body sweat. <laughs> so you still need to lubricate your chain and keep it clean. That's, yep. man, that's disgusting to think about. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty wild. Like uh, it's sweat can be... Um, incredibly destructive mm -hmm. some people have toxic sweat and they can eat through bikes um but so even just like non-toxic sweat mm -hmm. if you sweat a lot while you're working on your trainer especially since you're in a stationary position and if it drips on your bike quite often mm -hmm. i would also recommend just wiping down your bike again rubbing alcohol is like one of my favorite things but like soap and water um maybe like once a month once every couple of weeks if you're a heavy sweater if you don't sweat that much um you're usually fine okay yeah yeah oh and uh Getting a specific trainer tire is very helpful. They The rubber is um, uh, quite a bit more durable for being on uh, a pressured surface like okay. um, the trainer. And so they make trainer tires. Um, you don't have to have one, but you'll find that you'll have to replace your rear tire more often if you don't have a specific one. Okay. We had a question about uh, de-rusting a chain if it has gotten yes. to that point. Um, is that worth it or? So preventative uh, maintenance is the best way to do it. You could de-rust a train, but um, you're probably going to find that it's going to just rust, flash rust again real quick. Mm. So um, not letting it get to the point that it's rusted. Um, and if it has rusted in like you've brought it back, you might want to consider at your next scheduled maintenance um, at a bike shop to just go ahead and replace the chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So next scheduled maintenance. Yes. I guess we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But like, yeah, how often somebody should be coming in. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, we had a question about waxing the chain, which it sounds like the, they were asking about something that's different than lubricating it. So there are different kinds of lubricant. There's mm -hmm. uh, waxes that you can use. There's wet lubricants. There's dry lubricants. Um so the one thing about lubricants is if you're not wiping them down regardless what you're using, you're going to probably find that you're going to collect more uh, gunk than others. Mm -hmm. And wax is one of those things where it can collect more um, dirt and uh, debris um, if you're not properly ap applying it. Um, so in like a general novice, I tend to recommend steering clear of something like that mm -hmm. unless you're really like uh, adamantly putting in the work and, and paying attention to how you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it's necessarily better or worse. It depends on the condition and it depends on your preference. Okay. Um, but I would say my, my one thing would be like, just be very mindful of your application. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like it's 
much harder to do the application of a wax mm -hmm. on a yeah. chain than... And again, I don't think it's necessarily better um, in my personal experience. Okay. Yeah, anything, any other things on a bike that, that most people would be able to like adjust on their own? Um, Seat height is okay. very important. So um, a, lot of, a lot of times I've uh, encountered people who think they should be able to touch the ground while sitting on their <laughs> saddle. Um, and this is something I address probably almost on a daily basis during uh, the busy season. Mm -hmm. um, so you want almost a full extension of your leg with a slight bend in your knee while you're on the downstroke of your pedal. Um, if you're touching the ground from your seat and it's not a foot forward bike where it's made to, to be able to do that, mm -hmm. um, then your seat's probably too low. But two indications that your seat is too low is that um, your knees are hurting are a big one. Like, and, and you can blow out your knees by having your seat too low, which mm -hmm. is why like some people are like, well, it's just more comfortable or I feel safer. But you're risking injury. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like my main reason for addressing it so often. I've been recovering from a knee injury for a couple of years. It's not from my saddle height, but um, it definitely affects it. Mm -hmm. Like I can tell immediately if my saddle is even like a centimeter too low. I can feel it. Mm. Um, you can tell if it's too high if your hips are rocking back and forth mm -hmm. while you're pedaling. Um, yeah, I've I've felt a little bit of like just just a little bit of overextension on like behind my knee before, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oop, oop, time to yeah. lower that down a little bit. And that can definitely also cause injury. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's important to find your Goldilocks zone, mm -hmm. um, and and really dial it in. And you can nerd out about it over time, like by the millimeter. Sometimes that we get really <laughs> obsessive about our saddle heights. Um, but it's very, it is one of those things that are very important um, to keep your, your body safe because injury is real. Yeah. 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 I, I remember, I mean, when I was a kid, I learned how to adjust the brakes, in, you know, in a basic sense. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, then I then I went and got, you know, a bike that has disc brakes and I realized, like, I have no idea what to do with these. So first rule of thumb, don't touch the disc rotors with your fingers. OK. Um, the oils from your fingers can actually affect your stopping power. Mm. And if you do happen to do it again, that rubbing alcohol is like pretty great. Mm -hmm. Um so, and with disc brake adjustment, I highly recommend bringing it in, into a shop. Um, with rim brake adjustment, I also recommend the same. I've seen some really, really funky brake adjustments <laughs> or like over adjustments because really you just need new brake pads. So mm -hmm. it's unsafe because the stopping power is not correct. Or people are adjusting their brakes because their wheel isn't in the, in, in the drops correctly. And that's mm. like, that's why I'm like, oof. Um, so... If you're adjusting your brakes, um, my question is why, you know? Yeah. Yep. I think usually uh, when I when I had rim brakes, it was always like adjusting them because there wasn't as much mm -hmm. like tension, like, you know, there wasn't as much stopping power from pulling the levers as, you know, yep. the so, same amount. And probably like your cables break in over time, so mm -hmm. that can loosen up. Um, some of that you can do with a barrel adjuster, but when you are adjusting a, um, cable by at, at the brake levers or not, I'm sorry, not the levers, but the calipers themselves, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of, uh, how do I want to put this? Like most self adjustments I've seen are the incorrect way to adjust. Okay. It. So it's, okay. it's often done improperly, but it's super cheap to have a shop do it. It's like five bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a couple of minutes to have a professional do it. Um if you feel confident in your ability to do it, that's that's a totally different thing, you know. Um mm -hmm. some people are more mechanically inclined than others. But if you're a novice and it's not something you're familiar with, it's not something I recommend just trying out because stopping power is like so important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I haven't like felt the need to try to adjust my um my disc brakes on my own mm -hmm. because disc brakes like adjust the amount that they squeeze a cord you know yeah what as the as the brake pads like wear down yep so um i'm really glad you say that um and some of them like uh some disc brakes can be super finicky about adjustment some brakes uh disc brakes like low end disc brakes you can't even adjust properly you can never get them to fully adjust properly they mm. just have to wear down into like the placement <laughs> i mean they make me nuts cheap disc brakes are like 
my nemesis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I would much rather see a pair of like decent rim brakes than cheap disc brakes. That's uh, another thing I hear. Like people will say, well, I heard disc brakes are better than rim brakes. Mm -hmm. And I like to say not better or worse, just different, mm -hmm. um, except for cheap disc brakes because they're just bad. Um, but it di rim brakes are tried and true over 100 years. Um, disc brakes are great in acclimate weather. I really like my disc brakes for winter because I'm dealing with a lot more wet conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you can experience brake fade where your brakes just kind of stop working on the rim because they're not grabbing it if when your rim is wet mm. um, with rim brakes. Um, but for the most part, you know, I enjoy both. And I, I like how... Um disc brakes especially like they really sing when you first get out there on a cold day and then you like you're stopping for the first time and yep <laughs> yeah yep let's talk about recognizing when it's time to bring a bike into the shop um you mentioned your your scheduled uh yes. visit yes um uh, but uh, other than like just kind of feeling that there's something wrong with my bike. I don't really know. So we recommend like a yearly tune-up service at the least. Um, and if you're riding a lot more than just like a leisure ride or short commuting, sometimes it, or winter riding, that's a mm -hmm. totally different maintenance schedule. Um, you could need it a couple times a year. Um, my big thing that I look for is chain stretch. So I've been talking about lubricating your chain a ton. And what happens is if your chain is dry, um, it can stretch the chain faster. And if your chain stretches past a certain point, then you also have to start replacing like the cassette or the freewheel and back. It can also start affecting your front chain rings and then it gets really costly in repair. So if you find you're doing a lot of miles, doing that once a year tune up and then just swinging into your shop and have them measure your chain stretch is a super uh, easy way to save money in the long run. Um, and it's just a small thing to do. So. Mm -hmm. Or getting a chain tool yourself. Um, you mean for measuring or for Yep, for replacing? measuring. Okay. Yep, yeah. for me measuring your chain. Um, so the rule of thumb is if you have like below a 10-speed chain at 75% stretch, you should replace the chain. And at 1%, you're probably going to need to replace the cassette and back too. If you're going beyond that, then you might start shark toothing your front chain rings or your pulley wheels on your derailleur. Mm -hmm. um, if you have 11 speed or a 12 speed, it's 50% stretch. You need to replace your chain. And um, if you're riding an 11 speed pretty regularly or a 12 speed, a uh, chain tool is, or I mean, a chain checker is a really great investment. They're like 10 bucks, mm -hmm. but uh, 11 speed and 12 speed chains can be pretty costly and more so if it's like your cassette. Um, way more so if it's your cassette. So that's probably one of the things that like, and I would go into a shop and ask them to show you how to do it and how to read it because it's not always super clear. Mm -hmm. um, but it is one of those things that's going to be greatly helpful. Yeah. And then just a once a year tune up and that way you can get ahead of any problems that might happen later down the road um, and avoid having to do something more costly like an overhaul. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, one one thing that I have found really useful is um, I've been recording all of my trips on Strava, mm -hmm. and so then like every time that I take my bike in for something, right, to get the chain replaced or replacing a cassette or whatever, like I'll I'll mark down how many kilometers it is that that the bike has mm -hmm. on it in total, and then you know then I can subtract things and figure out like okay how long how long did this chain last versus the other ones and um yeah. it kind of gives me a better sense for like when I can expect the next one to need attention. Yeah. yeah. That that's one way you can do it. I, I find that most people aren't that uh meticulous. meticulous yeah. 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 I was gonna say do you also um chart what you wear in the winter at what degree? I, I have I have heard of people <laughs> who do that. Um I but I, I don't know. I, I I do all right with just kind of keeping that in my head, I find. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could really get meticulous. I've heard mm -hmm. some really incredible stuff that people do to to track, you know, their their maintenance or their their gear that they need. Um mm -hmm. but for the most part, like if you're not going to be that meticulous, if you, if you're not able to be that aware, just that once a year rule is a really great place to start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and if you're winter biking, mm -hmm. 
just bring it in in the spring <laughs> when you're done. Because if you don't clean it before you put it away, mm-hmm. then things are going to seize up and rust out like mm. crazy during the summer. And then you pull it out in the fall. It says for snowfall. And all of a sudden you realize your winter bike is toast. So that's uh, that's my other rule of thumb with the winter the winter riding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. And so should should that bringing it in once a year or so, um, should that also be able to cover like, you know, brake pads and things like, you know, yep. will all of that get checked before it should be a problem? Yep. Yep. If you get a good comprehensive tune up, it should check your brake pads. It'll actually most shops will go completely through your bike um, and make sure that everything is uh, rolling correctly. So. Check the adjustment on your bearings, your headsets, your bottom brackets, your shifting, your braking, all of your lubricating, all of your pivot points, making sure your cables are good. Mm -hmm. These are all part of that process. I do say beware of the the cheap tune-ups because really it's very limited in what they're doing. Um, But um, hopefully they'll let you know you know, if something else is going on. I just don't know how in-depth, uh, like, the the $40 tune-ups are. They seem to be, like, a bike wipe down, mm. a chain lube, a tire pump, and then, like, uh, maybe an adjustment of your shifting and braking. But the comprehensive ones are a little bit more involved. Mm-hmm. Pro tip, bringing your bike in in the fall or the winter and not on the first nice day of the summer is going to put you ahead of everybody else because everybody waits till that first beautiful day. Mm-hmm. And then they're, like, beside themselves that they have to wait to get their bike back. But, like, them and, like, hundreds of other people all thought of it that first night's day. So before you put your uh, bike to bed at the end of the riding season, Mm -hmm. that's a great time to bring it in. Just, like, after you're done with the winter season if you're winter riding. Mm -hmm. Um, And that way you're ready to go in the spring. You should be able to just pump your tires and ride. Maybe wipe it down if it's dusty. Mm -hmm. Should I – if I'm if I'm going to be – you know, leaving my bike for the rest of the season uh, mm-hmm. until, you know, until next spring or whatever. Um, should I leave the tires like at a lower pressure or does that not matter? Um, yeah, They're going to lose pressure as I sit there over time. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have tubes, then pumping them up is good. And maybe even like once throughout the winter, just so you avoid going totally flat and then mm-hmm. possibly potentially getting a pinch flat when you reinflate them. Hmm. Um I don't think that's as much of an option or a problem. It's usually that people will uh, let them go flat and then roll their bike to me. And that's usually when pinches happen. <laughs> okay. Um, tubeless tires are a different beast to get all together mm-hmm. um, because they uh, have sealant inside them. And the more they roll, the better they seal. Um, and if you leave them, mm. they will lose pressure. And you always have the potential of them becoming um, unseated. And then you have to take them into the shop to get them reseated if you can't do it on your own so for my tubeless i usually try to like fill them up once a month in the winter so they don't go completely flat or once every couple of months i just Mm -hmm. walk by and check them to make sure they're not getting to the point where they're going to come off the rim and then i'll have a mess on my hands in the the future (laughs) literally a mess Mm -hmm. yeah it's (laughs) terrible (laughs) i guess the other advantage of um having like a winter bike and a summer bike is that uh, yeah, if if I have to take my bike in and leave it for a while, I do have a second bike. That's super helpful. How should I recognize that my tires are too worn down? Okay, so um, depending on the tire, some tires like Gator Skins and the Continental brand of row tires have like a little... Uh, almost like a pock, like a little hole it looks like in it. And that's an indicator of when the tread has gotten, like once that hole disappears, it means the tread's gone and you should replace them. Mm -hmm. Generally, you can see with your tread that it's getting pretty worn down. Um, You can also see if there's any cracking forming around the the sidewall by the Mm -hmm. rim, if it's an old tire. Like some people's tires last forever because they don't ride a lot, but the the rubber will rot out before, you know, they're ridden down. Mm-hmm. Um, but your rear tire is probably going to go before your front one. It's the one that takes most of the weight. Um, and I just like to check it for wear a couple times a season. If you're getting lots of flats, uh, if you're picking up a lot of debris, mm-hmm. it's usually a good time to change your tires. 
I'm a big fan of puncture resistant tires. There's a lot of cheap tires out there and those tend to have to be replaced more often. So they're not uh, a good savings in the long run, Mm -hmm. you know. And then there's the obvious, like if there's any bulging or anything like that. Yes, if there's bulging, it's time. Like, and I've seen bulging happen in tires that seem to be fairly new. Um, Hmm. But there, you know, it happens and people are like, well, I thought I just replaced these a few years ago and something's happened to the sidewall to compromise them mm-hmm. or, you know, there's a number of different reasons that it can happen. Yeah. 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 One of my um, Xerxes that I had ridden for one winter season, when I put it on at the beginning of this year, uh, like, yeah, I, I was bumping a little bit in my seat because it had a little bulge and I was like, <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. But it happens sometimes, Do I guess. Do you usually ride with the Xerxes? Yes, yep. uh, during the winter, yeah. So those are 45 Norstedt tires. Um, mm-hmm. People really like them because they're grabby. We also very much like the Schwalbe Winter Marathon Pluses because they tend to last much longer. Mm. They um, put a new belt inside of it that really helps with puncture resistance. Um, Xerxes use carbide studs too. Um, anything in a Stead tire with um, just basic steel studs are not recommended because mm. you're going to have to replace them pretty often. Sorry, I know you didn't ask, but I didn't <laughs> fill you. No, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. What, what are, is there anything else that's different, like looking for in in a for maintenance for for a studded tire? Um, so finding a, a decent studded tire, people also like to get the uh, low cost ones, but again, those tend to have really cheap studs. If your studs are falling out a lot, it mm-hmm. might be time to replace that studded tire. Mm. Um, sometimes they have kits that can replace them. Um. And riding really low pressure can sometimes make that happen on some tires, mm-hmm. not all of them. Um, so I like to make sure to set my studs. Uh, when I first get my studded, like a new pair of studded tires, I like to ride them at full inflation um, mm-hmm. for usually a week or so. Um, just it kind of helps set the studs so they don't fall out. Okay. Um, and then watching for bulging and watching for um, cracking. Um, and then when you take them off, if you see the studs coming through the other side, yes. that is like prime time to change them. And that's why we like the winter marathon so much mm-hmm. winter marathon plus is cause they had just came out with a new belt that has like basically eliminated that, mm. which means a much longer lasting quality product. I believe I did have one flat tire last winter. That was because one of the studs had like poked through yeah. under the inside. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that a couple of times, uh, a couple of flats last winter as well that had happened the same time too. And I was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, what else? I mean, I guess everything else really should be left (laughs) to a professional like shop. Um, So what are all the different services that a shop provides? Like I've heard of truing wheels is a thing that happens that i definitely don't ever want to have anything to do with people who really love train wheels i believe have a little bit of (laughs) self-loathing like it's all of our wheel guys who love wheels i'm like the amount of uh finesse and patience and attention to detail it takes i'm like i'm it's not me i'm a more of a like smash it out kind of person so (laughs) um so, yes, truing wheels, uh, which means uh, adjusting the spoke tension to keep a wheel perfectly in round. Um, wheels can start wobbling over time. Uh, Low-quality wheels like uh, single-walled rims, um, especially from pothole impact or heavier riders or being very upright on a bike, can put a lot of stress through mm. a rear wheel. Um, so, generally, like, a uh, comprehensive tune-up is... Is that thing I was recommending before, and that at our shop that includes a wheel true, a deep clean of the bike, and then um, you know we go through your bike and make sure everything's adjusted properly, shifting, braking, um, replace what needs replacing, lube your pivot points, and keep an eye out for anything you might need to be aware of. Um, so you can get services that include that, um, but if you find that you even see your re- wheel wobbling, it's it's usually about fifteen bucks, fifteen to twenty mm-hmm. depending on the shop. Um, and uh, it's a super helpful thing because if you let that go, you might end up needing a new wheel. Right. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, and I guess it's probably worth noting that, like, if you're seeing a wobble, it might be the wheel or it might be that the tire is, like... It could be that the tire is wrong, too. So yeah. that's why just bringing it in is great because it could be that you have that bulge in the tire. Mm-hmm. Um 
sometimes you can discern that on your own. And if you can, that's really helpful. Um, but if not, it's something that a professional could pick up right away. The beauty part about taking your bike to a shop is not only are you supporting a small local business, but you're also getting your work warrantied. Mm. So like if you try something at home and it wrecks your bike, you might be out a very expensive part. Um, if your bike shop wrecks your bike, well, they're liable for it. So right. um, that's one of the benefits of going to a shop um, along with many, many other things. But um, And then there's the overhaul. And for our overhaul, it comes with complete bearing replacement. Um, so mm. your wheels have hubs and your hubs have bearings in them. Um, your bottom bracket has hair bearings in them. Your headset has bearings in there. Uh, I've heard... Uh, people say like, oh, they just need to be cracked open and put new grease in. Um, unless they're sealed, that is not the case because uh, your bearings will sit in a cone or in a race in a certain way and um, they wear in a certain way. So mm. if you open them up, you've moved those bearings and they're no longer sitting in round and can actually start destroying other parts internally in the hub. Um, bearings, bottom brackets need replacement quite often, um, hmm. especially on winter bikes. And when I say quite often, I, it's like, you know, once every few years, depending on your riding style. Okay. Um, I guess, but not always that often. Um, it tends to be, I feel like bottom brackets tend to need to be overhauled more often than, say, the hubs do. Um, but having that checked regularly is helpful. If your hubs are not adjusted correctly or your bottom bracket or your headset, um, then it can uh, cause damage down the road. Um and so that's why it's important to have that checked. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a brand new bike out of the box and it was built and those things weren't checked, um, you can destroy your cones or your races or many other things. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel grindiness when you're pedaling, often that's a good indication that you might need a new bottom bracket. Yeah. Or yeah. I had a I had a pedal seize up uh, on me at the end of last winter. So I think that's th – there are ball bearings inside a pedal, right? There are. Yeah. You can't generally replace them though. You right. usually have to get new pedals. Yeah. Yep. That's what I ended and up And most mystery uh, creeks we find are almost always, well, not, no, they are usually pedals. Mm. I mean, they, they can be caused by many other things, especially if you have like a carbon bike. Mm -hmm. um, but pedal bearings usually, like if you start pedaling and you're hearing a, a creaking or a squealing, like often that's where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And those wear out, especially on cheap pedals, pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I've had a, a surprisingly often, uh, where I'll take my bike into a shop and they'll be like, ah, we need to replace like this derailleur cable entirely. Uh -huh. Um, is there, is there a way to like, y am I not taking care of my no, not necessarily. bike in the right way? Or? Um, derailleur cables are uh, a part that, um, it's it's a replacement part, so it should be something that you're probably replacing. They just stretch over time. Mm -hmm. They get corroded over time. Um, sometimes the little end caps come off and they fray. Mm -hmm. um, they are a really inexpensive thing that uh, affects so much. It's really amazing yeah. to me, like how much a cable can impact. Um, and they're like three or four bucks usually, so mm. they're not um, crazy. But there's really not a lot that you can do to like not have to replace them. Mm -hmm. You have to replace them faster if you're winter riding. Mm. Again, corrosion from from our our elements, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The the really obvious time that I had a problem with um, a shifter cable was when it literally just like severed and came out of <laughs> the uh, the the unit on the handlebars. Yeah, and I was like, well, okay, I guess I'm in the highest gear for a day <laughs> until I can get to a shop. I hope you weren't on a tour then. No, okay. no, that was, I was just like commuting to to work. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's not uh, as common as just stretch. That's fairly uncommon. Yeah, uh, I mean, not super uncommon, but that's probably one of the fewer reasons I see people needing cable replacement. And that was on my that was on my old bike, which I had had for almost nine years, and definitely was not bringing it in yeah once a year <laughs> yeah i mean a lot of uh, so many people don't um and then i also get like my dad i had to have this whole conversation with him where he was like my shifters are just not working and and the guys at the shop said they were just they're they're old so i think that my shifters are broken and i was like i don't know i think you might just need new cables pops 
And finally, he just I mailed him some new cables. He lives in Montana, and he's mm-hmm. an auto mechanic, and he replaced them. And he was like, oh, yeah, no, it's perfect now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, those cables. Um, I also didn't realize, um, and this was, this was on my old mountain bike, uh, when I brought it down to you guys, this was a couple of years ago, and you, you told me, oh, yeah, the front fork here is totally shot. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't know that's a thing that could happen. Yeah, um, yeah. Is that unique to, like... To, to bikes that have um, shock absorption. What's it called? Um, shock forks? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so older shock forks in, can and often go out. Um, so we deal in used bikes a lot. Mm-hmm. And so many of my like mountain bikes from the 90s, like old hybrids are awesome because I can uh, rebuild them very easily. But a lot like maybe a third of my old mountain bikes, the forks are just shot. Mm-hmm. Um, they are... On like entry level or um, not or not super high quality ones, they aren't really repairable mm-hmm. um, or serviceable. And then on nice ones, they're repairable and serviceable, but it's expensive. Mm-hmm. And they recommend um, shock uh, maintenance by the hour, like how many hours you ride, which can get okay. like pretty crazy. Huh. Like you know, like for this shock, you probably want to service it once every twenty five hours of riding. You know, um, for for higher end ones, mm-hmm. but they seize up, um, especially yeah, on those older mountain bikes. So yeah, what what is what is the result of of a shock going bad? Is it like that you don't get as much of the shock absorption, or is it that like do you lose some stopping power because it's sh- like things are shifting as you're trying to break? Or so um, you don't lose stopping power from that necessarily Mm -hmm. um but you do lose the shock ability okay um and that that's the bigger thing to it um and so like on our when we're uh fixing up a used bike if the shock's not working and it has a shock fork well reselling that is is pretty difficult Mm -hmm. um and it can it adds so much weight to have a shock fork so if that shock's gone bad you're almost better off just getting a rigid fork Mm -hmm. if you're not replacing the shock fork itself um, and again, depending on the quality of the bike, what that looks like. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that that's something that I didn't learn until I was buying my new bike was that like, oh, yeah, you, you only need suspension if you're going to be really going off-road mountain biking. Yeah. Um, when you're riding around on roads, you don't need it at all. It takes out so much of your forward momentum. It makes you so much more work mm-hmm. for it. And like... In the 90s, it was so popular and shocks and dual suspensions and especially in like department store quality bikes, like it was the thing. Mm-hmm. And so people think like, oh, well, I need shocks because I'm going to be more comfortable. And I'm like, that's not necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely is going to make you work harder. And again, what's right for you is what right what's right for you. But right. that's just like for the most part, we find they're not really needed. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that I was talked out of that that frame of mind. Before. Yeah. The <laughs> other thing we see too, it was like kind of like a I'm I in the seventies, like large road bikes. Um, for some reason in the seventies, like Schwinn made all these super large road bikes and it, it seemed like their selling technique was like, if you can get your leg over it, it fits and the bigger, the better. And like, <laughs> I, not the case. And I'll get people in who still have that mentality that they'll think that they need a, like an extra large bike and they're, hmm. you know, maybe a medium. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I'm like, no, it, it's, it's actually like gonna be harder and more painful to ride you know Mm -hmm. um if it doesn't fit you correctly and i am tall enough that like yeah most people can't get their legs up over (laughs) over the top bar on my bike so (laughs) yeah (laughs) i get to keep that as a point of pride i guess i have the reverse where i'm short enough where Mm -hmm. like a lot of bike companies don't make bikes that fit me yeah yeah All right, so we have a few miscellaneous questions from folks online. How how can I tell if a wheel is an upgrade from my bike's stock wheel? Um, so it's a little tricky uh, while you have the tires on. So And it depends on the stock wheel. So an inexpensive stock wheel would be called a single-walled wheel. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you take the tire off and look at the rim strip, um, usually you can see the spoke nipples. Mm-hmm. Um, 
kind of sitting on top of the rim on the mm-hmm. inside. And if it's a double wall wheel or a triple wall wheel, the spoke nipples, you can you got to kind of look down into a hole to okay. see them. That's okay. a good way to tell. Now, then, if you're talking about upgrading wheels, the sky's the limit on upgrades. So <laughs> it, if it's more lightweight or made of, like, nicer components, like the hubs are nicer. And, and this takes a little research unless you just go in and ask, you know. Mm-hmm. Um so if it's a nicer wheel, it's usually going to be stronger and it's usually going to be lighter. Okay. Yeah. Weight is weight is everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> everything. And I, my like people always tell me like I want a really lightweight bike and usually on a budget and I'm like another rule of thumb in the bike world is the less it weighs the more it costs. Mm-hmm. Yep. Which is kind of a funny thing to think about. It really is. <laughs> Um, why are there so many different tire sizes? Oh boy. Um, I wish I had a good, uh, answer to that because, uh, tire sizes and wheel sizes have gotten ridiculous. Mm. There are so many different, uh, wheel standards and tire sizes. Um, I was writing a training manual for our shop, Mm -hmm. um, for working on the sales floor. And I was writing, you know, each section, talking about products, talking about components, things you need to know. And I got two tires and I was eight pages in and I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) So I don't know why. I mean, tire sizes, different widths of tires ride differently, I guess Mm -hmm. is the short answer of that. And then there's also different diameters of wheels. So that can affect a, a tire size. So and thinner. Then there, there's also like volume, right? Of mm-hmm. the tire. So, and thinner tires um, tend to be more lightweight and, or I should say, used to be more lightweight and more uh, common for racing, like okay. the, the more narrower tires. Uh-huh. Um, that's changing, I think, uh, as. Um, the technology, uh, for lack of a better word, of Mm -hmm. um, the progress of tires, you're able to get like wider tires that are more lightweight. And the thought pattern was that the more narrow the tire, the faster you go. But physics teaches us that that's not actually true. And so we're seeing the entire industry go to a wider tire size. And also because of our infrastructure. I think across the the entire US we have issues with cr- crumbling infrastructure uh-huh. and those really skinny tires are really tough especially uh-huh. for city wide riding um and then like if you're going off road or gravel or cyclocross or mountain biking wider knobbier tires can get you more traction you can mm-hmm. also ride a more low pressure to get more grip um so i think the answer is there's so many different uh sizes of tires because there's so many different styles of riding Mm -hmm. um but uh as far as like a good technical answer like it's there's just so many different components to like wheel Mm -hmm. size and tire size and like you said earlier like it's not everything is super standardized no nothing is (laughs) um so actually that that was one of my questions is like can i just assume that if i walk into a shop like, for example, if I'm out on a tour, right, you know, how how sure can I be that they will be able to service my bike and, you know, fix a particular problem that I'm having with a component? So um, I'd say probably 80 percent sure um, that they can do it on the spot or, mm-hmm. you know, without having to order something. But there's so many different standards that it's almost impossible for every shop to carry every uh, everything you might need. Mm-hmm. Um, we do find with like tires, that's pretty common unless, and you will know if you have a weird size. Um, mm-hmm. So most shops will have what you need. If you have something really new, cutting edge, um, like um, with, that's come out like and become pro- gained popularity within, you know, the last couple of years, sometimes those are things that need to be ordered mm-hmm. because they're less commonly bought. And so to stock them doesn't always make sense to a shop. Um, so I'd say about 80%. Like on a general bike, most things are available. Okay. Yeah. That's good. I've heard that some shops will let you like, they'll have like, like tool days or whatever where they, you know, you mm-hmm. can come in and like get 
trained on how to use particular tools and do particular things. Mm -hmm. Um, And then... And then, like, I guess you're allowed to come in and use the tools if you need to every once in a while or something like that. Um, how common is that? Pretty uncommon. Okay. Um, so in the Twin Cities, there were a couple of shops that had uh, what was called open shop. Yeah. Um, and you could come in and use their tools. Um, it is kind of uncommon because it is a hard thing to staff mm-hmm. and um, prevent loss um, mm. and oversee. And again, so... When you're working with something like Open Shop, the amount of help most people need to just figure out, like a novice might need to figure out repairing something on their own is mm-hmm. quite extensive. Um, so we're seeing less and less of that because it's not really um, something that most shops can maintain in the long run. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some amazing classes, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is probably going to be more helpful than anything. Um, instead of having guessing at how to repair a bike or having somebody teach you who doesn't really know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, like I know the hub and I think Freewheel both offer a large multitude of classes. Mm-hmm. Um, we've offered some classes for like how to do the things that you should be able to do at home. Um, usually there's uh, different uh, repair classes you can take. You okay. can take like a basic repair class class that will teach you how to, you know, change your flat. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you can take more advanced classes as you you go. So you can adjust your own, you know, derailleurs or Mm -hmm. in different things like that, or build a wheel, you know. Um, For us, we work with volunteers. And so we generally tend to work with a smaller group of people Mm -hmm. and one-on-one and like throughout a long period of time, teach them bike skills. Um, Because it's not anything that's really a quick, easy thing to pick up. Mm -hmm. Again, there's so much to know, um, especially with like so many different varieties of bikes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of varieties of different bikes, what's the weirdest bike that you've had to work on? Oh, man. They're all pretty weird. Um, But (laughs) uh, so I, I was thinking about this and like. There's weird as in, like, I've seen some really amazing um, vintage, like, road bikes that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the weirdest things about bikes is kind of the weird trends that I get hit with. Okay. So, for example, um, Shimano's first index shifter was called a Positron. And it's uh, really weird. It takes very specific and special parts. And that in itself isn't odd that we had to work on it but one week we had eight of them come in and why in this one week in like our nine years of business did eight of these come in Mm -hmm. i don't know but i tend to find that that's actually pretty common or like really weird sized tires um where i might sell two in like four years Mm -hmm. of a week where like 10 people show up looking for that tire so i find that kind of weird yeah yeah (laughs) what's the hardest part of a bike to service so the thing that I've seen most mechanics struggle with um, and the part that I have the hardest time with is the front derailleur. Okay. Um, so it's it takes finesse and it's finicky. And on low-end bikes, it's really difficult. Like mm. there has to be a level of um, being meticulous and being patient mm-hmm. and kind of a perfectionist about bicycles. But like low-end front derailleurs – That's not the case. You can't be a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. You have to get it right, but there's like a good enough point, um, which isn't usually the case with most tires. Is that why most of the shifting mechanisms, like for the back derailleur, it'll be, you know, one click per gear but then on a lot of front derailleurs it's like you know you have kind of a whole range of tension that you can put into it yeah it's because that kind of is is Mm -hmm. it because that kind of precision is like really difficult to nail down i think so i think so um i can't say for sure why i just know that that does tend to be the thing that i see people struggle with the Mm -hmm. most um and even experienced mechanics you know like there'll be one that just gets them and it it is it it performs so much of a function in such a little Mm -hmm. piece of equipment Mm -hmm. yeah um and my last question is uh does every good bike shop have a good dog um if they're a good bike shop, I feel like they should have a good dog. <laughs> it's becoming more popular. Um, I do have a bias to my bike shop and my dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it helps, though, um, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely, because, like, walking into a bike shop can be a pretty intimidating experience. Yeah. But, you know, having that, like, friendly face who isn't going to judge you 
because it's a dog. Exactly. You know? <laughs> Somebody to like um, help uh, temper your anxiety. Mm-hmm. You can get some fur hugs and like, yeah. it's okay. Because, um, and I, I hate that uh, walking into a bike shop does feel intimidating. Like, mm-hmm. I really, that's something that we really strive to change at our shop because um, bikes are amazing and there's so many different styles of people and different styles of riders and like, Nobody should be expected to know everything or anything for that matter. Like, mm-hmm. There's a lot to know. Um, but I do. I think that the dog helps drastically. Yeah. 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 So Lower Town Bike Shop. Mm-hmm. You guys uh, believe that a bike can change your life. Correct. Anything else uh, that you'd like to say about your shop? So we specialize in new and used bikes for all budgets and all styles of people. Um, that's really important. And um, we really believe, like I said, in sales through education. So we are happy to answer any questions. There are no stupid questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have an amazing dog. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. And and located in the beautiful Union Depot. Yes, I suppose I should say. The Union Depot in St. Paul, Minnesota. We are the last up on the light rail. So we're easy to access. Mm-hmm. Yes. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for joining me for this episode. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us for this episode of The Extra Dimension. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. This episode is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any or all of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which again is thenexus.tv slash TED52. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, you can go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash TV. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence. We're presented with so many choices in our lives, how do we make sure we're making sound decisions? By getting a second opinion from an informed source, of course. Lucky for you, the hosts from across the Nexus use lots of hardware, software, and media, and analyze them on our show, Second Opinion. From reviewing the latest phones and laptops, to pitting apps against each other, we've got you covered. Find us on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for Second Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player.